Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar. My name is Anthony Doles. I'm the direct, events director of the Netherlands Business Council. I will show you the agenda for today and make some housekeeping comments. Ria. So, we have a webinar which takes about one hour. I know it's short, but uh, that's short and sweet. Um, we will have a few introductory welcome comments by Barbara Faranek Matonet, chairwoman of the BBC, in a few minutes. Thereafter, I will make a few introductory comments uh, to our speakers, which are for today Robin Mills, chief executive of Calmar Energy and author of The Myth of the Oil Crisis, and Monica Malik, uh, chief economist at Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. We hope uh, to keep about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of these presentations for Q&A. Just for on the webinar operations, um, everyone but the speakers are on mute. We have a chat channel open. You can actually record your questions uh, during this call. We hope to deal with all those questions at the end. Uh, if you want to review this webinar uh, or have another look at the slides, uh, there's a lot of detail in it. You can find these uh, after the webinar on the NBC website. And now I'd like to give the word to Barbara, Chairwoman of the Benelux Business Council. Please. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. We hope that you are all safe and healthy. So, as Anthony told you, I'm Barbara farnik Matane. I'm the Chairwoman of the Benelux Business Council. Thank you for joining us today to our webinar jointly organized with the Netherlands Business Council. On behalf of the BBC and the NBC boards, I would like to welcome you all. The subject of today's webinar is the oil and gas industry and the economy in COVID-19. There is so much happening in the oil and gas industry today with much lower oil prices and even for future contracts, negatives for a short period of time. The future of the industry is now more uncertain than ever with the world and regional economies that have been severely hit by the COVID-19 lockdown. We are very pleased that two recognized experts have agreed to give us today the insight and to answer our question. As Anthony said, thank you so much and welcome to Monica Malik and Robin Mills. So thank you for taking the time in your busy agenda to be with us today. Uh, Anthony, Anthony Dolls, Director of Events uh, of the BBC, of the NBC, will be our moderator today. Uh, Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara, for those introductory words. We are very delighted that so many of you connected today, which first is a sign that people are looking for relevant views. In these. Before giving the word to our speakers, some introductory remarks from our side. As Barbara said, times are not only uncertain, but what is happening today is also highly unusual. I've been working in and with the oil industry for more than 30 years and never seen anything like this happening, what's happening right now. Perhaps in some lighter versions of events, but not the current with the current magnitude. The same counts for the economy. The slowdown we are experiencing uh, is of epic proportions. And so are restrictions on our all our movements. I therefore would like to phrase it as a tectonic shift. Tectonic shift. It feels like the earth is moving below our feet. I do not want to steal the thunder of our speakers, but just a few highlights to underline what I was saying. I believe that several things have been coming together now and creating a perfect storm for both the oil industry and the economy. Ria, next slide, please. So, tectonic shifts. I think you can argue with me about that, but some things that I've never seen before is the oil price turn negative. It's uh, incredible. Oil demand drops like a rock, uh, more than 15 million barrels per day. The oil industry has, and talk about the integrators, have cut, cut capex for 35 billion and announced layoffs of tens of thousands of people. As for the economy here, everybody has seen that last week, layoffs in the UK, in the UAE, um, will cause some 900,000 expats to leave. 40, even 50% reduction in the salary are no exception. All asset values are under severe pressure. And you see that GCC countries are now having trouble in financing their budgets. Uh, and Monica will talk more about that later, no doubt. Next slide, please, Ria. 
just a few slides to illustrate this. You know, we've come up to uh, oil prices from 25 to 150 uh, 50 barrel, uh, dollars per barrel. And like I said, the dip of below zero has uh, everybody has seen that it. it hasn't been for long. Prices have recovered, but this was highly unusual. Next slide, please, Ria. And this is shows you a bit the, the cliff of which the demand went down and production luckily went uh, alongside with that, not just voluntarily, but nobody had any more place to store oil or gas. Uh, next slide, please. Ria. This is just an illustration, uh, which was in the report of 17th April of how much reduction there has been in capital investments uh, across the industry, across the various sectors here. Next slide, Ria. And I think this is sort of a clear question now, uh, no doubt we will come to that later. What about uh, the resurgence of uh, the recovery here in the, in the region? I mean, this, this is just a slide Bloomberg of April. Uh, this is uh, the sources of April 2017, the dependence on expatriates. How interesting and how attractive will the region be for expatriates to come back after all this crisis have, has been there? So without further ado, I would like to uh, give give the answer to uh, the, the the floor to Robin Mills. Robin uh, doesn't have any camera at the moment, so you won't see his face. Besides, on the slide here, uh, Robin, please. Robin, can you hear us? I think we're having a connection problem. React. Can we hear Robin? Anthony, do you think Monica could begin maybe? Would that yeah. be an option? Yeah, absolutely. Monica? Yes, I'm ready. There you go to the next pack of slides. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you very much. Um, Anthony, sorry, I've, uh, that's my work email popping up. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to give you a quick overview of the GCC, but within a global context. So without further ado, if I could move to, to the beginning of my slides, please. Thank you. So I think, you know, a good place to start off is to highlight how this crisis is different to other global economic crises. Normally, especially since um, the, the 1930s, if we look at the main economic crises, they've stemmed from the financial market and then spread into the real economy. This time, it's very different. This comes from a health pandemic, a global health pandemic, which is impacting the real economy as governments try to stop the containment of this virus spreading. And, and um, therefore, it's, it's going from the real economy. Of course, it's got impact on the financial markets, but the outlook is very different. And, and the ways to come out of this is very different than, say, the last global financial crisis. The first two charts I have on this slide are, are linked to, to the COVID numbers. You can see, at least in the large uh, global economies in the US, Eurozone, um, China, we've, we've seen a flattening of the curve, though the, the numbers continue to rise on a daily basis. The marginal pace of increase 
have come down. Of course, there are variations by country and by region. But we've seen in the GCC, again, there's greater variations. We've seen some countries like UAE managing to flatten the curve, but, UA, uh, but Saudi Arabia, for example, we've seen since there's been an opening up of the economy, the pace of numbers being reported have increased. We've also seen announcements, for example, in Oman, that they're shutting down the Dukum port because, again, a resurgence of numbers. So this is really going to be critical. It's that fine balance of restarting the economy without allowing this virus to spread. And there's still a lot of uncertainties about that. And there's a lot of talk about, of course, about the shape of the recovery. And I think until we get um, either progress with a vaccine or progress with uh, containing the cure, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to, to resume normal global economic activity. Now, I mentioned um, that normally a crisis starts from the financial markets. This time around, we've seen the financial markets, the bottom left-hand chart, we've got the, the global stock markets, and you've seen them rebound quite strongly. Yes, we had a retracement at the end of last week, and I think that's very positive because I think markets have moved far ahead of the real economy. But a lot of that has been the very proactive stance of regional governments, of global governments and, and global central banks. Um, they, they learned their lessons from the economic financial crisis. Um, you've seen expansion of QE programs, very quick cutting in interest rates. Governments have uh, announced all sorts of fiscal programs, especially to keep employment intact. Um, so that partly reflects that. But I do think there is quite a lot of optimism in financial markets. And I do see that at some point there has to be a closer link between financial markets and the real economy. Moving forward to the next page, please. Just a few, few uh, charts on, on global economic growth. Now on the top left, um, uh, uh, top left chart, we've got the economic forecasts by the IMF. Now, these have come out in, in the first quarter of the year, and I believe that they're going to be revised down substantially. But nonetheless, even where they are now, you can see the global economic contraction is going to be substantially deeper than it was in 2009. Um, the top right hand chart shows the contraction by country or by region. I think um, especially areas such as India will see a contraction, but also you can see, for example, US, UK and Eurozone will see a contraction of over 5%. We saw headline GDP come out of the, the UK for April on a month on month basis, the economy contracted by about 20%. If we think of how much industrial production production was lost, nearly a third of in the industrial production was lost in the Eurozone um, in April itself. As I mentioned, as global economies have started to open up, as we have seen some, some sign of a topping off in new numbers, you've seen somewhat of a rebound in manufacturing and service activity, but still very uh, well down from its pre-crisis levels, still a sharp contraction on a global basis for both manufacturing and, and services, with services hit more, which has significance for our region. For us, I, uh, our forecast suggests non-oil economic active uh, GDP growth, which we see as the most um, reflective of economic activity on the ground, will contract by over 5% uh, in our view. Moving forward to the next page, please. Um, this again just highlights some of uh, some of the, the the central bank measures that have been uh, taken. We've seen the interest rate uh, cuts. Uh, that's the top um, top left hand chart, especially by by the Fed. Um, we've seen asset purchases rising very sharply as well. 
However, one overhang from this crisis is going to be on, on uh, the employment framework. We've seen jobless claims rise very sharply. Um, the bottom left-hand chart is of the US, and yes, you saw in May jobs growth. Um, I think uh, at the end of the year, the Fed still expects double-digit unemployment, even though we do expect to see job growth from, from May, um, and, and that's going to, after the first initial bounce, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to bring it down marginally going forward. So yes, we'll have the bounce, but then again, there's concerns of the second wave. How quickly can economic activity resume? How quickly will we get a vaccine? And we can see also, as you have unemployment going up, um, pay cuts, as, as Anthony mentioned, you're going to see very weak inflation backdrop as consumer spending um, stays down. In our region, um, uh, most of the pay, uh, wage, uh, employment cuts will be expatriates, and as Anthony mentioned, that will lead to a contraction in expatriate population. Going forward, just moving to the GCC, normally I would have a few charts on, on oil, but I'm going to leave that uh, to Robin, who will cover it much better than I can. But, you know, of course, for us as a region, we are very externally facing. Of course, the number one area is we remain an oil and gas exporter. And as a result, we're going to feel the impact of, of the uh, fall in oil prices very, very severely. Uh, we see the funding requirements of government re governments rising very sharply this year as fiscal deficits um, rise. And, and also we'll see not only the oil side, but the non-oil side. Um, if we look at our non-oil economies, they're mostly in services and they're mostly externally facing. And those are going to be the areas that are going to be the, the slowest to recover on a global basis. So areas such as trade, transportation, logistics, tourism. Um, as a, as a, a global transshipment hub, UAE especially, we'll see non-oil revenues fall very sharply, and I have a few charts and slides on that at the end. But if, if we look at the top left-hand chart, there are differences within the region. So if we look at the countries that are expected to have the largest fiscal deficits, these are Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. These are what I classify as, um, uh, well, one important way to look at the GCC countries is hydrocarbon endowment per capita rather than just pure hydrocarbon endowment. Of course, you know, Saudi Arabia has the largest uh, reserves, largest production levels, but it's relative um, the hydrocarbon production and output to population because with the social contract, this is what the governments have to spend to look after their population. So all these three countries, Oman, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, have high populations relative to, to hydrocarbon endowment. So a lot more of their oil revenues have to be spent on that. Historically, that's meant at times of higher oil prices that they've had lower surpluses in in surpluses, current account surpluses, the reserves built up are much less. And we're seeing the reverse now that we've got low oil prices. You're seeing much wider deficits. On the other side, you've got UAE, Qatar and Kuwait, who have um, you know, much smaller populations to their hydrocarbon endowment. Even amongst that group, you'll see, for example, Kuwait has made very little, uh, very little reforms on the on the um, diversification front or the fiscal reform front. UAE more so. And if I could take you to the bottom right uh, right hand chart, there you've got the differences um, on how the fiscal side feeds into into the reserve and debt position. So Bahrain, Oman, and Cup and uh, Bahrain, Oman have the largest debt levels, the lowest FX reserves, UAE and Kuwait on the other side. Um, if we look at their liquid reserves, UAE has liquid reserves of two, over 200% of GDP, Kuwait of over 400% of GDP. In the case of Kuwait, that also reflects the fact that um, they haven't been spending much, but very low debt levels, 
much greater ability to maneuver this. In the middle, we have uh, Saudi Arabia, which still has fiscal space. Now, since this the oil price crisis, the number one question I've been getting is about the GCC um, pegs um, to the US dollar, the currency pegs. You can see um, on the top right hand chart speculative activity for a devaluation increased um, in March and April as oil prices fell not to the same level as we saw in, in the global economic crisis, but still elevated. And much of the pressure was on Oman. And even though Oman has better fundamentals on a standalone basis than Bahrain, the fact that, that Bahrain has a GCC support package gave the market a lot of confidence. For example, Bahrain has already tapped the international debt capital market in May being the first uh, global sub-investment grade sovereign to tap the markets. And, and a lot of that has to do with this wider GCC support. In the case of Oman, you've seen the, 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 the speculative activity coming down very, very sharply from, from the March and April levels. Two factors are central to that. One is, is the fact that we've had oil prices move higher, and two, over the weekend, we've had indications that Oman is uh, opening up to talks uh, with the wider GCC for support. Um, and our core scenario is that a package will be forthcoming and Oman will be able to weather this crisis. But just a few points on, on the GCC currency pegs. Our view is that they will remain intact, that they are the best currency regimes at this point, given the economic makeup of the GCC, the fact that most of their exports are US dollar uh, denominated, either hydrocarbon or petrochemicals related, or the fact that they import most of their goods uh, from overseas. A weakening of the currency would mean a sharp rise in, in um, inflationary pressure. You wouldn't have the substitution to domestic production as a devaluation of the currency normally uh, um, ha has as a side of the line. The, the wider non-oil productive base in the GCC is, is, is very, um, very, very weak. And I think the final point I'd like to highlight is the GCC pegs are effectively uh, proxy pegs or passive pegs. Um, these are just the rates that central banks, regional central banks, buy and sell to local banks in, in their economies. Um, they, they do not allow speculative activity. They look for fundamental uses of those. And, and as long as there's domestic uh, confidence uh, from the banking sector on these currencies, we're seeing enough liquidity. They are not using their reserves to support these prices. If you had a more flexible currency, you would need the use of reserves at times of lower oil prices and speculative uh, pressure. And there we could see more uh, losses of, of reserves than we have with the pegged currency at the moment. Going forward, please. But again, I think, you know, what we have seen as the funding requirement increases is, is the move to, to um, tighten fiscal policy. Yes, the, 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 if we look at the measures introduced by GCC countries, most of those have been on the monetary side. And in my view, that really reflects the fact that um, the fiscal space, although there are variations uh, within the region, is relatively limited to, to support, um, on, uh, as we've seen, for example, in Eurozone, uh, announced recently, but especially UK and US. Um, the focus will be on supporting the domestic population, creating jobs for the domestic population, but the expatriate population is in a way a shock absorber at a time of strong growth. You have the influx at a time of weaker growth. You have the, 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 the loss. Saudi Arabia, we on Saudi Arabia here. You can see, for example, large losses 
in FX reserves um, over the last two months. Yes, part of that has been to to renal funds such as Mubathala also looking um, for for val value um, overseas, but it also reflects the the, the borrowing requirement uh, of the government. You can also see that the net borrowing from the banking sector um, is going to increase. And as an indication of real non-oil activity, the bottom left chart shows the sharp fall in consumer spending um, in, in April, uh, March and April, in fact. And you can see how that's really fallen off a cliff. Saudi Arabia has been some of the most proactive, but you've also seen Oman, Bahrain, and talk about uh, spending cuts, uh, both capex and current account. But Saudi Arabia has also moved ahead by tripling VAT, uh, which will start next month, and they've moved unilaterally on on that front. I, you know, UAE and other uh, countries have come out and said they won't follow, but. That's really going to highlight that the recovery is going to be very slow because oil prices are, are substantially below budget break even oil prices, fiscal balances will widen this year and fiscal reforms will be needed. For last year, we, we um, estimate a budget break even oil price for Saudi Arabia of about 85, more than that for Oman, closer to 90, about um, 68 for the UAE. Uh, Kuwait in, in, in the 50s, but you can see roughly that is the range of, of the budget break even oil prices. So not only will we have the direct impact of, of the COVID-19 uh, as economic activity shuts down, but also as you have um, the fiscal adjustment that needs to take place. Going forward, please. And here I just have, you know, a few slides um, on, on the non-oil activity and, and I have some indicators, for example, um, for the, the on, on globally, we can see how, how the, the, the global shipping activity has fallen. And of course, that's going to have impact for countries like um, uh, UAE, particularly Dubai, where we've got Jebel Ali, but also Oman, which is increasingly growing their transshipment and logistics business. Um, we can see also in the bottom right hand chart, this is airport passenger numbers in Dubai, which, you know, even in the first quarter of the year, fell by about 20% year on year. And of course, the impact is going to be substantially greater for the, for the second quarter of the year before we start seeing some sequential improvement from the below of 20, you know, second quarter. But on a year on year basis, it's still going to be well below. And our view is that in the GCC, non oil activity and overall activity by the end of 2021 will still be below crisis levels. That's also the case. For the US, Eurozone, UK, this is going to be a global phenomena. Even though we might have a sequential bounce, activity will take time to recover to, to pre-crisis levels. Moving forward, please. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight just on, on, on global, on uh, regional liquidity, as I mentioned, most of the measures introduced by, by regional uh, policymakers has been on the monetary side. Um, this time we haven't seen uh, liquidity tighten. Um, a number of factors are important. With the stability of global financial markets, we've seen external borrowing even for countries such as Saudi and Bahrain. And that's meant that domestic liquidity does not have to be deployed so much to meet government funding needs, um, but also because of, of the extra liquidity created um, as a result of the, the monetary loosening. So if I could please take you to the, to the top right-hand chart. This is UAE. It's the interbank rates of, of three-month EBOR and, and US LIBOR three months. And you could see at the beginning of the chart in, in 2008-2009, the pace of differential and how much that had widened to now it's really at, at, at sort of normal levels thanks to these liquidity measures. Even in countries like Saudi Arabia where the funding requirement of the government is higher, we haven't seen that pressure. Um, so at least that's, that's a positive. We are, you're seeing a key tenet of the government uh, central bank policy is to make sure banks have um, the liquidity available to continue to lend to the real economy. There's been also debt 
um, deferrals, uh, debt, um, you know, that's both on a corporate basis and on a on a uh, individual basis. So it's very much trying to tackle the crisis through that way. And on on my final chart, I've just got a summary of of some of the UAE measures introduced um, by by the the government. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, maybe that's not there, but if anyone wants that, we've got a list of all the GCC countries and, and the, the, the support measures introduced, which I'm happy to share uh, as, as, as requested. Uh, I'm very cognizant of the time, so at this point I'd like to conclude my presentation and pass on to Robin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. I think there was some good news among all the bad news. And I think one of the topics that we probably kind of discuss uh, in the question and answer is whether we will have a V, U or W recovery type. And, uh, you know, there's again in the news, a lot of talk about a possible resurgence of COVID and what that will do. So uh, the storm isn't over yet. Thanks very much. Uh, Robin, I think you're online now. You, we don't have you on camera, but you're online. I see you. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks everybody, and hope we've overcome the uh, the uh, technical problems we had earlier. So I hope you can all, all hear me clearly. Um, so thanks, Monica, for that excellent uh, overview of the economics. And I'd now like to turn to the uh, oil and gas sector, uh, which is obviously the underpinning of the regional economy, and, and how that's coping with with COVID and uh, and what the outlook is. So if we could go to my first slide, please. So the um, Coronavirus, as we know, has caused an unprecedented drop in in oil demand because of the uh, the lockdowns, first in China, then in Europe and, and parts of the US and, and other countries. Uh, and, you know, we use the word unprecedented a lot at the moment, but it really is uh, because in a normal recession, we might see global demand dropping by one or two million barrels per day. Um, in this one, we have seen an instantaneous loss, uh, a loss on a monthly basis of perhaps 15, 20 million barrels a day, that the loss of oil is so enormous that it's it's been very hard to quantify because normal statistics have, have broken down. And on an annual basis, we're looking at a loss of somewhere between eight to uh, eight to nine million barrels per day on the current estimates. And you can see the three main forecasting agencies here, you know, they, they were looking at, if we looked at um, the start of the year, they were looking for growth this year in, in the range of a million barrels per day or so. Of course, they very quickly started reversing that. Um, and now we've seen that the estimates for demand loss leveling out in the in the, the eight or nine million barrels per day uh, range. However, uh, a lot of this is based on on the idea that we're through the worst uh, and that the lockdowns are easing and, and people are returning to travel and so on, which is true in China and and is true in in some of the countries that are getting on on top of uh, coronavirus. However, there is the risk of a, of a second wave or, in fact. Um, still the, the continuation of the first wave. Uh, if we look at Brazil or Russia or some of the southern US states, they're still in their first wave of coronavirus. Um, and then after that, there's the, the risk of the economic fallout and uh, the, uh, the, the very heavy debt that's been built up to cope with the, uh, with the coronavirus, the, the very high levels of unemployment, which will take a substantial period to work down. Um, and then the, the other knock-on impacts, uh, potential fiscal uh, crises in, in various countries. And then the longer term impacts, what are we going to see coronavirus doing in terms of new ways of working and traveling? You know, one uh, school of thought says that people will be staying away from public transport, people will be driving more, um, so demand will even be higher. There is some evidence from that in, in China, um, but I think that's, that effect is probably a relatively limited and temporary one. Probably more significant longer term is what happens in certain ways of in terms of new ways of working and traveling will people having seen how easy it is to work from home really feel the need to commute to the office every day maybe two days a week is enough will people feel the need to fly around the world to conferences and business meetings when when they've seen so much can be done virtually and i think we, we can think at least that uh, air travel particularly won't return to anything like the post coronavirus normal for for several years or at least until um, there is a reliable vaccine or treatment so next slide, please. Uh, and the direct effect of, of COVID-19 on the Gulf remains profound. 
So I've shown a few illustrations here, the number of cases. As I said, the number of cases is uh, still rising in many countries. We've seen actually a double peak in Iran. Um, we've seen still a rising level of cases. So the format of the first charge has been translated well. But uh, anyway, it's, it's showing the, the number of cases in Iran, Saudi, um, UAE, and, and some of the other regional countries. UAE cases are falling, but in most of the other regional co countries, including Saudi Arabia, cases are still rising. Um, if you look at the traffic congestion, the uh, top right chart, you can see that we are uh, in the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. We're starting to get back to some evening congestion, but we are still nowhere near the 2019 levels. So still greatly reduced uh, levels of, of, uh, of road traffic. Um, the gasoline demand has fallen very, very sharply. Um, so about a million barrels per day of gasoline demanded the GCC in normal times, GCC plus Iraq in the normal times. That dropped to, we estimate about 500,000 barrels per day uh, at, at the worst of the, the lockdowns has now rebounded to about um, somewhere over 800,000, but still well down on normal. And the number of daily flights from all the major airports in the region, pretty much close to zero. Yeah, and yes, we're here to talk about restarting, but uh, major normal uh, flight activity hasn't resumed yet. So next slide, please. However, the market has been somewhat rescued by the OPEC Plus agreement. Uh, at the start, the really sharp fall in price, of course, was triggered at the start of March by the breakdown of the, of the previous OPEC Plus agreement and a short but uh, pretty intense price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, the new OPEC Plus agreement has been put in place and has, has tightened supply significantly to the point that we might even be, be approaching a, a deficit in supply starting to draw down some of the very large uh, surplus stocks that have been built up during uh, during March and April. And compliance so far to the agreement has been very good. Um, Saudi, the major players, we look at Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, UAE, they are at pretty much 100% compliance. Um, Russia, which was uh, in the previous agreement was a serial under compliance, has been very close to full compliance. Uh, that's important as it's the, with Saudi Arabia, the largest producer in the alliance um, and some smaller countries have not complied so well but the, the, the one that or the two that have really uh, under complied so far Iraq and Nigeria have come under quite a bit of pressure from uh, from Saudi Arabia and other big countries to, to improve their compliance now the compliance as I said in May was was very good um, so overall about 85 percent June will probably be better as people catch up on their obligations and the deals now extended to July as well and after that cuts are supposed to be gradually uh, step down. Um, however, I think Iraq is unlikely to achieve full, anywhere near full compliance. There's a lot of technical and commercial problems for Iraq to cut production heavily that they're already running into. Um, and um, in the end, I think as with the previous agreement, OPEC, you know, although they can uh, threaten the Iraqis, they have limited tools to force them to comply other than walking away from the deal entirely, which nobody wants. Um, and as prices rise, so we were now back to about $40 per barrel from Brent from the, from the low 20s in, in, in March and April. Um, we are now, um, $40 is, is not great, but it's certainly more comfortable. And there's a growing incentive if prices rise further for other countries to start under complying uh, or, or overproducing a bit. Uh, however, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think OPEC has to be careful not to over tighten the market. Um, OPEC has cut production on, on February levels by about 7.6 million barrels per day. Um, and that is an enormous loss of market share. If you think that in normal times, demand would grow by a million barrels per day or a little bit more each year, OPEC can't afford to take seven years getting back to its, its, uh, its early 2020 market share. So OPEC has got to be, I think, a little bit aggressive in returning its production, even if prices are fairly low. Uh, until it gets back to something like what it was producing at the, the start of this year. Um, and, and not to overtime the market, not to let prices get too high, um, which will just make, make the adjustment more difficult. Next slide, please. And part of the, the issue with OPEC is obviously the concern about shale. And we saw this in the last uh, phase of the um, price slump in 2014 when shale production was growing exceptionally quickly 
Um, the market crashed, prices crashed, shell oil production did fall, but not as much as OPEC had hoped. And then OPEC eventually came up with the, the OPEC plus agreement and prices recovered and then shale bounced back very, very strongly in 2017 and 18. This time the crisis has been even more acute. Um, and you can see this on the, on the graph where uh, the US rig count pretty closely follows the oil price. And we've seen a drop, a very sharp drop in recent weeks, not surprisingly. Um, the shale oil drilling has eventually, effectively become completely uneconomic in, in almost every part of the US. Uh, and, and it'll still take some time of course, for the full impact of this to, to work through as, as companies uh, come to the end of big contracts and, and they'll review them and so on. Uh, you can see on this chart, of course, the historic drop in uh, West Texas oil prices to minus, or almost minus $40 per barrel. That was a bit of an aberration, um, but still uh, the very low prices at, at that point have, have certainly reduced the rig count. And a number of US uh, exploration and production companies have, ent have entered, uh, have default, started defaulting on debt or entered bankruptcy proceedings um, there are perhaps 80 something companies that, that look highly vulnerable. Um, we're going to see a very large shakeout of the US shale sector. Um, if um, several of these companies uh, and, and most US shale companies have acted to shut in production, that's simply not economic, even on an operating cost basis. Now, at $30 a barrel plus, which is where we are now, those shut ins are now being reversed. So it's at least profitable to keep current wells operating. Um, but to drill new wells and, and uh, fracture and complete new shale wells, we will need to see $50 a barrel plus to see sustained activity. Um, investors have been burnt on the shale sector uh, at least twice, and uh, there's not a great uh, willingness to pour more capital into it um, after it failed to deliver sustained returns, even with high oil prices. So we will see US shale bankruptcies. We will see a massive amount of consolidation stronger companies such as the majors, Chevron, Exxon, uh, will take over weaker companies, but we shouldn't expect to see a lot of activity in a new investment. Uh, we'll just see companies sitting on assets producing what's available until prices recover significantly. Next slide, please. And broader in the industry, if you think globally, uh, there have been steep spending cuts. So uh, again, if we go back to 2014, when the oil price Previous oil price slump came into effect. You had an industry at that point that was spending about $850 billion per year uh, on, on upstream, so new oil and gas uh, production. That has dropped, that dropped by almost 50% going up to 2016, didn't really recover from then. And now into 20, 2020 and 2021, we're seeing another 29% fall. So, and that would bring this down to about 400 billion per year of investment. So, so less than half what it was at its peak. Um, now the, the post-2014 drop actually didn't do too much in terms of missing supply, uh, partly because of momentum from projects that had already been launched and partly because there was a lot of room for efficiency, cost savings. And of course, it's the marginal projects that get cut first, the ones that are making least contribution to, to new supply. Uh, however, yeah, we can think that this case perhaps is gonna be different because we've already reaped most of those cost savings and efficiency savings. Um, we've seen the steepest drop in investment in shale, uh, which is a short cycle production. So wells are drilled and come on production very, very quickly. Um, the longer term production in general, um, particularly offshore production has been less effective. Yes, yes, spending has dropped, but not as much. Um, but, uh, but still we can imagine this is gonna have a, a significant effect on on OPEC, uh, non OPEC production growth going forward. So, is this going to lead to a, a shortage of oil uh, over the next few years as, as the economy recovers? Next slide, please. If it does, then OPEC would have a chance to regain market share. Um, so, if we look at the, at the production uh, and supply demand outlook over the next few years up to 2025. So, you know, in 2019, we were producing something over a million, 100 million barrels per day. Um, there's a natural decline in production from, uh, from uh, non-OPEC plus countries, uh, if they're not reinvesting. There are, of course, some new projects. There is a certain amount of new production going on. Um, and if we add, add all this up, we, we would say that if we're back to about 106 million barrels per day of demand by 2025, 
um, then OPEC would be called upon to put another 7 million barrels a day on, on the market by then. Now, how could OPEC do this? Well, if we assume that the major OPEC countries go ahead with their plans for production growth, and then, and then that they produce pretty much uh, flat out. So Saudi could gain 3.3 3 million barrels per day over its, over its average 2019 production. The UAE could gain 1.8. There's a bit more from Iraq and, and Kuwait. Still leaves about a million barrels per day of, of other, and, and it's quite hard to say what this other is. So you could imagine that by 2025, the market would be looking, up, uh, looking a little bit uh, tight with, with OPEC producing pretty much at, at maximum and still about a million barrels a day of, 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 of unnamed supply. I mean, to come from somewhere. Um, however, I, I, I'm still kind of cautious of this thesis that there's going to be a lot of underinvestment and, and a, massive, uh, a massive shortage by 2025. Firstly, because I think 106 million barrels per day by 2025 from where we are currently would be a pretty dramatic rebound. Um, and um, and that, that really, you've got to assume a very strong economic recovery from the coronavirus and, and, and no real long-term effects on oil demand. Um, and secondly, really, because I think analysts persistently, uh, you know, ever since the 80s at least, have persistently overestimated OPEC production growth. Every forecast shows that, that within a few years, OPEC, OPEC will be producing 50% of the world's oil, have a very strong market share, and, and it never quite gets there because the oil price spikes that occur inevitably dampen demand, um, because demand, est the, the demand estimates in general tend to be over optimistic, and because non-OPEC always grows more than expected. Uh, there's, there's unexpected supplies and sources of new supply. And if prices do recover by 2021 too, uh, we will see some of this, this underinvestment starting to come back. So next slide, please. Now, the gas market has also been uh, heavily affected by coronavirus, not as much as the oil market. Um, the, the effects of, I mean, the major effect of coronavirus, of course, has been lockdowns and, and interruptions to travel, and that has affected oil very heavily. Gas, you know, gas is used for power generation. Uh, it's used for home heating. Uh, it's used for industry and petrochemicals. Most of those things have continued more or less as normal. So if you look at electricity demand in, in, in European countries of lockdown, yes, it's down by somewhere between 10 to 20 percent, which is significant, but it's not nearly as much as, as the 60, 60 to 80 percent drops we've had in, in oil demand. However, the gas market was already struggling. It's already oversupplied in 2019. So in that sense, the, the gas has come on top of what was already a difficult situation. Uh, liquefied natural gas has been struggling to find a home. There isn't enough demand for it in, in Asia. It's been going to Europe. European storage is, is nearly full. It's at record highs for this time of year. Um, and European countries are looking for creative places to put, to, to put gas there. They're even shipping gas back into Ukraine to try to store it there. And Russian indices there are different markets for lng and quite a wide spread of different prices depending if you talk about asia or european prices or or prices as low in the u.s Major pricing indices have converged. So, um, if we go back a few years, we're in a situation where US, uh, US gas was selling at two dollars per, per million British thermal units. Asian gas was selling at ten or fifteen dollars. So there's an enormous divergence. Now we're in a case where US gas is two dollars, two dollars fifty. Um, Asian LNG is at two dollars. Um, Dutch gas or, or UK gas is at two dollars. So there's, there's been a remarkable conversion. To all of these. And when this happens, of course, US exports become unprofitable. I mean, there's no point spending all the money to liquefy gas and ship it halfway around the world to get already for that gas in the US. So US exports are continuing because there's, con there's contracts you can't easily get out of, um, but there's no incentive for new exports for anybody who liquefaction plants to try to reduce their throughput. 
and the products and the actual products are not profitable. Uh, so if we look at the major countries that we're going to plan new energy plants, Russia, um, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, Australia, uh, Canada, various new projects around the world, those are not profitable at current prices. Anybody who's taking an investment decision on those projects now is gambling on our significant recovery in prices. And so this matrix, you'd expect that by the mid 2020s, the energy market ought to be rebalancing. Um, and uh, the prices will have to rise to get to get new supply um, within by the mid 2020s. And that's probably true, but it does depend very much on how quickly it does. And whether it can really grow again. And if gas can be cheaper. National companies are contending with. Um, a difficult situation. Um, and I've just shown one example there of Iraq, Iraq is in a particularly vulnerable situation. Um, if you look at the way Iraqi production has, has come down, or Iraqi exports have come down, and they've, they've dropped this year. Um, but more dramatic than that has been the drop in revenues because of the falling oil prices. So in 2019, Iraq was earning about six to seven billion dollars monthly from oil exports. Uh, the Iraq government budget. Um, and now, okay, prices have recovered a bit, a bit since then, um, but it's still a very. Um, so, the national companies in general um, are going through production cuts because of OPEC limits, they're going through spending cuts. There's some concern about coronavirus outbreaks actually countries affected by that. It's not structured concerns, but not an actual outbreak. Um, but uh, that obviously remains a uh, does remain a worry. And really, this is a mixed picture for NOCs. So there are stronger NOCs if I think about adlock. You can see their current strategies with with something of a readjustment. So, although they raise bonds, they they sell uh, minority stakes in, 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 in non core assets like pipeline units. They rethink their projects and save costs. And you know, as any oil company would do, they they delay some projects. And we've seen uh, ad not doing this to try to uh, uh, either uh, delay projects for a few years or, or, or reduce the um, contractor costs. And they do continue boosting production capacity because they see that from the graph that I showed earlier that by the mid 2020s there's likely going to be a need for new OPEC oil and their production growth plans still make sense. They already had downstream plans, i.e. boosting their refining petrochemical capacity, so they continue with that. Um, they invest in gas as they were doing domestically. They invest internationally. We've seen uh, Qatar Petroleum quite active in international investments in particular. Uh, they improve their technology and try to move into the next generation of oil companies. And they're still able to think a bit about a climate resilient strategy. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, boosting low carbon technologies. For the weaker NOCs, it's a very different picture. And I think about the uh, Office of Iraq in this case. Um, we think about, uh, think about Libya, Libya NOC, think about Nigeria, um, think about Sonatrack in Algeria. They're in a much more difficult position. They will be starved from budget because all, all the demand from the central government will be to pay as, as much revenues as possible to support the government budget. Um, there will be a pressure for privatization and asset sales. We're certainly seeing this in Oman at the moment. Um, but on the other hand, it's not a very nice time to be trying to sell oil and gas assets. Uh, and, and in some countries, at least, there's a strong um, uh, political and, and nationalist pressure not to do that in, in Algeria. Is, is one example. And production will decline. And again, several of the, the small OPEC plus countries' productions will be in steady decline. Again, if I think of Algeria or if I think of Mexico, uh, production has been in decline for several years and there's no, no real chance of turning that around without a lot of international investment. Um, so, really, there's quite a sharp divergence between 
uh, between the two groups of NICs. So next slide, please. Yep, and that's uh, that concludes it. And I think we can move to the Q and A. Great, great. Thank you very much, Monica. Maybe you can put your camera on, then we can see you as well. Uh, let's, without further ado, let's go to the questions. Maybe this one, uh, actually, a slide I showed. It was put on that 900,000 expatriates could leave the UAE. Um, and the question is, uh, is there any idea about the pro profile of these expatriates? Um, is it only low-skilled workers or high-skilled workers? Do, do you have any data on that? I don't have any data. There's no data out as yet. Um, and, and there's actually no signs actually of the percentage numbers. But based on um, our discussions, we're assuming that it'll be a double digit contraction. Um, some sectors are seeing more pressure than the others. So, of course, uh, sectors such as airlines, hospitality, um, those are going to be the one of the hardest impacted and um, will take a very long time to recover. All right. Yes, sorry. So uh, maybe it's from. They'll take a long time to recover. So I think, you know, you're going to see a lot of job losses on that side uh, over 10%. We're seeing real estate construction having a lot of job losses, but I think it's going to be at all levels. I think, of course, it's going to be um, high mid um, levels. That's going to have the most impact on, on a corporate. It's much easier to cut back that way. Um, and I think, of course, you know, the, the blue collar workers as well. So I think it's going to be pretty broad based. And as a result, we see it filtering into other areas of the economy. So it's going to result in uh, loss in demand for housing. So we've already seen downward pressure on rental prices and sale prices in the UAE, but also in the wider region as well. And that's going to impact. And then it becomes a cycle because then there'll be less spending, less demand for rental prices. And then you keep putting the prices down. So I think this is going to take a long time to get demand back up to where it was. Right, right. Thank you very much. Uh, there's actually also a question for uh, Robin, and uh, there's a question here about a potential cover, uh, reduction, uh, in risk uh, and particularly what kind of risk management the GCC should do uh, when oil prices are going to continue to be volatile and potentially uh, again dropping down to, let's say, lower levels, twenty dollars or whatever. Yeah, well, look, I think this is, is an extremely difficult uh, point and a difficult challenge. So uh, during the coronavirus, we've seen a lot of countries launching stimulus packages, of course, um, and spending very heavily raising debt. Um, but the GCC countries have been kind of constrained in doing that because um, oil prices are so low and they're, they're very concerned about drawing down their, um, their, their reserves too quickly when the outlook for oil prices is so uncertain. So they haven't really been able to have the large stimulus packages that they might have wanted. Um, and there've even been some contractionary measures like Saudi raising the VAT and the customs duties. Um, so these are this is a bit of a, a, a conundrum for these countries. And I think they've also had a bit of a taste of, of a future uh, where oil demand is dropping and oil prices are low and, um, and they're under severe fiscal pressure and, and, have to search for other sources of revenue while still keeping the the, uh, the domestic economy afloat. Uh, and in that sense, you'd hope that this would emphasize yet again the urgency of uh, of diversifying, diversifying the economy, but also diversifying the government revenue base and diversifying exports. You know, those three things all have to go together. Um, now, I mean, at the moment, there's obviously kind of crisis management uh, activities, um, but in the, in the longer term, I think we just have to think that um, that this creates some real impetus uh, behind some of these diversification efforts. Uh, and it's always a bit of a paradox, of course, that when oil prices are high, you have plenty of money to, to diversify, but it doesn't seem so urgent. And when oil prices are low, um, you realize how important it is, but uh, you, haven't, you haven't got the money for things. And the only solution to that, of course, is to make the business environment more, more attractive and more open for private sector investment, whether, whether domestic or foreign. Um, but particularly in, in new export-oriented industries, uh, and those can be linked to the, the, the energy sector, um, 
but uh, but they have to just get away from this simple dependence on, on oil and gas exports. I think, Monica, do you have something to add? Because what I think what Robin is alluding to is all medium to long term. I mean, it, it, if, if there's going to be another drop in oil prices, it would most likely be sort of conventional measures, reducing capital expenditure or whatever. Absolutely. But I, I think, um, you know, just to add to, to Robin's points, it's 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 very difficult for the GCC because so much of the the demand in the non-oil economy comes from oil revenues, governments accruing it, and then spending it. So it's it's very hard to get that balance of, of when the government's pulling back um, spending, but they want non-oil uh, income to rise, but at the same time, demand in the economy is coming down and you're not a diversified economy. So it's, it's very much uh, a catch-22, but I think, yes, absolutely, you're going to go back to um, the policies of 2015 and 2016, where it was all about fiscal consolidation, and that will filter in to weak non-oil GDP growth. And, um, you know, of course, this year it's going to be, um, as we've all said, you know, really exceptional and unprecedented because large chunks of the economy are going to be shut down um, for, for a, a while and a, a variation of time. But the whole point is how do we recover from this? And when you've got, you know, oil prices well below the budget break, even oil price, um, it's, it's, it's going to mean um, government spending being pulled back, new reform measures, and, and it's going to be a very, very slow recovery to add to the, the the population decline. And if I could just add that, you know, in 2017, 18, 19, the real support mechanism was that oil price was rising and the government was was increasing spending and they stopped the fiscal adjustment program. Well we're back we're back to the levels of 2015 and 16 and it seems far more urgent now. But it's how do you reform an economy without spending? Yeah. Very difficult, very difficult. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Robin. It's related to a lot of comments that you see in the press as well, that this uh, sort of corona time and the, and the events are a reason for the oil industry to focus on becoming greener. Actually, the whole society should be, become more green. Um, uh, what, what do you think in terms of uh, that momentum? Is that going to happen? Is there actually are the governments going to be able to turn greener in, in, in the current time? Or is, is it, as Monica is saying, money again, sort of uh, in short, uh, and, and transformation is becoming more difficult? Yeah, look, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's a mixed picture. I think, look, on the whole, like globally, the recovery uh, measures will, will certainly have a, a very green emphasis to them. We look at Europe in particular. The, uh, the European Green, Green Deal. Uh, if we look at the US, well, that sort of depends on the elections, the November elections, but uh, the Democrats would, would be pushing forward a, a new Green Deal. Um, and I think just generally the trend is um, with the financial institutions and so on to, uh, to put more and more em emphasis on you know, so-called green, green investments and, and screening ants and other kinds of investments. If the Gulf is going to be depend more dependent on, on external finance for its projects, um, and it's going to be dependent on the markets that are making this kind of green turn, um, then, then the, the Gulf will have to play along with, it, with that too. Um, so I don't think there's going to be a big, uh, a big appetite in the Gulf for a lot of green spending for its own sake, simply because the money uh, won't be readily available. But I think the, the customers and, uh, and finance is going to drive that. And more and more the economics in the sense that, you know, particularly renewable energy now we see is, in this region, so that solar power, it's, it's been a tremendous success story, and, and it is uh, now much cheaper than power generation with, with oil or gas. So, you know, just there just is a very sensible economic reason for it. If we think about some of the other initiatives, like hydrogen, which is being pushed as a as a major green theme for the, the oil, uh, as, as a method of uh, transition to the oil and gas industry, um, now hydrogen is not commercially viable today. It needs policies and subsidies to support it. So I, I don't really see the GCC pushing that on its own. Uh, I think if they do that, they will have to do so in partnership with countries like Germany and, and Japan that are that are very keen on hydrogen and will be willing to put up the financial support for it. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I have a final question. I'm conscious of the time. 
uh, we shortly run over, but one more question, and uh, maybe Monica, you can answer that. It's, it's a question which I don't fully understand, but it's, uh, it refers to the carbon tracker economist banker evaluation of the risks to fossil fuel assets and the risk of collapse of the financial system. Uh, you know, if the, if more or less if the transition is not fast enough, will, will there be risk to the financial system uh, because of the current situation? I'm not sure if I got the. I, I'm not sure if I got the question uh, properly. The global financial system is about the link to the recovery. Yeah, is the global financial system at risk because of uh, the current uh, situation and the fact that it's difficult to switch now to a more sustainable economic situation? Yeah, well, I think on the, the financial crisis, absolutely. I think, you know, at the moment, what you've seen is is that central banks are just throwing everything they have, uh, throwing up all previous, you know, rule books to support the financial markets. So now the, the, the Fed is taking junk bonds as collateral. And I think, you know, two things that are very important. One is going to be the pace of recovery. And, and two, um, you know, as, as Robin mentioned as well, how do we how do we come out of this globally on the fiscal side on the monetary side if we look at the, the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 every time you had um some talk about reducing the pace of asset purchases you saw a massive wobble by the markets and in a way financial markets have now been held hostage to, I mean, sorry, the central banks are hostage to the financial markets. You've seen them re rebound while the real economy hasn't. And I think that normalization hasn't even happened from 2008, 2009, uh, whilst we're having, you know, everything else thrown at it. Junk bonds being accepted, I think that's that's just incredible. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's a lot of risks when we come out of this, a lot of risk, a loss of income, overvaluation of asset prices, um, you know, the, the environmental side where, you know, again, I think um, we're at a critical point. Uh, let's just hope where, you know, I mean, if you think on for the environment, we need less consumption, but the whole global economy is based on, on continual com consumption, continual growth for corporates, continual growth for stock markets. And if we really have to move to a new system, that role of the financial markets and corporate profits have to be uh, disconnected. So that's going to have a lot of re-basing um, of the economy. What does that mean for employment opportunities for a you know, large chunk of the global population? And I don't even just mean financial population, it's for the corporates, for the tourism. Um, so I think, I think we're at a very, very difficult and critical point. Right, right. Thank you very much for that. I think we're coming to the end of the seminar. I think uh, if I sum up what I've learned, the, the, the more you know, the less you know. <laughs> We've had a lot of details from you and uh, from Robin. And I'd like to thank you again for your valuable time uh, to give us all these details and answer these questions. And uh, let me remind all participants that you can play this webinar back. You can look at the presentation. And uh, I would also uh, encourage you to look at our website because we have a lot of webinars coming up. And thank you all and have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.